The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Benjamin J. Heckendorf. Every week he takes on new projects, shares tips and tricks, and answers your viewer questions on The Ben Heck Show. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. In today's episode, we're going to complete the Raspberry Pi Portable by 3D printing a cool case to put the components in and then wiring everything together. And fingers crossed, the wires all fit. Let's get started. But first, the news. Today in Ben News, I'm excited to go to the 2013 Maker Fair in San Mateo, California. It's always great to see the cool new projects and meet other maker geeks. And for the bring a hack dinner, I'm going to bring my Raspberry Pi portable because let's face it, there's gonna be a lot of pie at this Maker Fair. All right, it's part two of the Raspberry Pi portable project. Here's what we're gonna do in today's episode. We're going to start printing the rear of the case. The rear of the case has a lot more mass than the front, so we need to be printing that while we assemble the front. We're gonna laser cut some parts for the front of the case so they look nice. Then we're gonna assemble the front, the LCD screen, the buttons, and the front panels. Then we'll move on to the back of the case. We'll install parts in the back of the case. Uh, that's where the Raspberry Pi is and the batteries. We'll make sure the analog stick fits. It's so tall, well, it's tall in this project. We have to mount it to the back, but make sure it doesn't come up too far in the front. We'll interconnect the two halves of the case so they can be opened up and then folded together like a book. Again, always make things you can take apart. And then we'll do final assembly and test it out. People often ask me, how can I make cool cases like you do? I don't have a 3D printer or a laser cutter. Well, you might have a CNC machine without knowing it. Your printer. If you have an object that fits within a sheet of paper, your printer will print it out at 100% size, making it a perfect template. You can take this pattern, tape it to a piece of material, and trace it out with a knife to create a perfect template for your project case. In the previous episode, we put the parts on this piece of paper and traced a box around it to represent what the case will be. Now we're gonna take that idea and put it on the computer so we can make a 3D printed case. So I started in Adobe Illustrator and I drew something to represent the Raspberry Pi right here. Then I drew a representation of the LCD and then the case that went around it. So I started in two dimensions because it's just faster that way. And then what I did was I took these three dimensional shapes and I scanned them into Autodesk 123D, which is a free 3D rendering program. It starts as a sketch, which looks like this. It's just a you know, vector drawing of what you want to extrude. Then you change the perspective. Uh, let's do this, okay, there we go. You change the perspective and then you extrude the vectors up to create a solid you know, mesh that you can 3D print. And this is the front half of the unit. You can see it has holes here for the controllers, here and here. It's got some gaps here for the USB and the power switch. And there's a frame right here so we know where to put the screen. So yeah, we drew the front and the back in two dimensions. Then we made three dimensional versions of those and now we can print them with a 3D printer. However, the front faceplate will be laser cut. Here are the parts that I have made for the case, and we're going to start with the front half of the case. We have our 3D printed structure right here. 3D printers are great for obviously creating strong plastic objects that you know, fit a dimension. However, they don't always look so great. So for the actual show plate, I have laser cut some black acrylic and some engraving plastic. So this is what the front of the unit will actually look like. It'll look nice and uh, modern and sleek. Then we have our buttons here. We have our four action buttons and then two of the menu buttons. Those will be mounted behind here. There's two more buttons back here. And we do have an analog stick as well. However, that's actually gonna mount to the rear of the case, so we'll, we'll install that later. 
Then of course the screen goes in here and we have these two flanges and left and right, which make sure the screen's in the right position. And then finally, we have our buttons, which are, again, the silver, plastic, and acrylic. So I will start assembling. Now these uh, thin walls are kind of flimsy, but when you attach a faceplate, it gives it a lot more structural integrity. Uh, another analogy might be your computer monitor at home. The glass of the LCD actually is most of the strength. The plastic itself is quite flimsy, or your car, the windows actually create a lot of the structural integrity. And press this in place. Several years ago, I built a single-handed gaming controller for a wounded soldier, a type of project I never realized people needed. Since then, I've built numerous accessibility projects and learned there's a lot of people out there with special needs that technology doesn't always have an answer for. The Element 14 community is addressing one such need with Project Nocturne, a new special initiative to improve the lives of people living with long-term medical conditions or cognitive impairments and their caretakers. Join the team working with the Bath Institute of Medical Engineering to create a sensor to monitor a patient's sleeping patterns. The project needs engineers familiar with low-power Bluetooth sensors, the firmware and TI sensor tags, and Android iOS BlackBerry development. Not an engineer? You can still play an important role by submitting your personal caretaker stories to help the team understand the various needs and uses for this type of device. For more information, visit the Project Nocturne group at www.element14.com forward slash project dash nocturne. The thing I like about tack switches is you can hear if they're working. <laughs> These are all working pretty good. I am Iron Man, and you haven't seen it. Time to put on the faceplate so everyone knows what it is. You know, I reckon at Maker Fair this year, last year at this time, Raspberry Pi uh, wasn't really out and about. They're in short supply at the start. This year, I expect to see all sorts of things at Maker Fair built with the Raspberry Pi since they've been out in the wild for a year now. Well, I'm not saying like I expect like I'll be disappointed if I don't. I just think it's probable that I will. Here's our LCD screen. It has our main power switch hooked up to it. And it should fit right between these two columns. And then on the other side, we want to uh, basically make sure it's the right vertical position. Not the vertical limit, your favorite movie. There we go. If Apple can glue products together, so can I. So I hooked up the batteries in the Raspberry Pi just to make sure everything's still working. Always check over and over during your project, make sure things are still working before you put them together because it's a lot harder to fix them when it's all in one piece. That's about all I have to say. Now that the back of the case has been printed, I can start assembling the rear of the unit. Starting with the joystick, it's the lowest part, then the Raspberry Pi, and then the battery pack. All right, time to go. Do, 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 do. Now I can install the Raspberry Pi itself. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh man, I should have tapped these holes first. Oh. 
So there's gonna be a hole in the back so you can get at the SD card still. Not that you really need to, but you know, why not? I wanna make sure that the wires fit when I take this apart. So here's it open. And as I fold it together, see how the wires will get bunched up? So you have to have enough room in your design to accommodate for that. And we do, but uh, I often forget so anyone could forget. I'm going to rewire the uh, headphone jack now. It has four prongs on it. It probably has a disconnect and a pass through. I'd better hook it up the way it was originally, otherwise the automatic audio to HDMI or this headphone jack might not work. So I'm gonna hook up all four wires plus ground from here to here and put it here. I'm gonna fold these wires so I can make them lay flat and wrangle them, but I have to keep track of which one's which as I go over. I'm going to start working on the battery now. Make sure I've got all the metal points covered so it can't short circuit. Then I'm going to attach it to this charging plug. And I'm going to use the interrupt on the charging plug to make sure that you can't charge it and run at the same time. Just to be on the safe side. On this power jack here, this pin in the middle connects to the center pin. And these two connect to the ground. When this thing is unplugged, this pin connects to this pin. But when you plug it in, this pin is disconnected and the ground here goes to that pin. So what I can do is if I use the outer shell for positive voltage, I can have this basically when you plug it in, the unit can't turn on when it's charging, just, just to be safe. So that's how I'm gonna wire it. Kick it. All right, I have the charge jack hooked up. So when the jack is out, the current will pass through the jack and go into the unit. When the jack is in place, it will disconnect the positive side so the battery can charge without interfering with any other components. So to make sure I wired this correctly, I'm gonna let it boot off the battery, then I'll stick in this jack without any power on it, and that should cause it to turn off. If it does, then I know that it's wired correctly. Ready? Yep, all right. So now what I'm doing is I'm wiring the analog stick up to the Teensy so the controller will work. Great story, yeah. <laughs> now I wanna make sure these wires are pretty flat. Even though we probably have room, we should always assume that we don't, just to make sure we keep as much space as possible. So I'm keeping on these wires below the surface of this teensy, not above it. So now I'm going to attach the buttons. There's two buttons on this side. I'm gonna bring the ri ribbon cable down and over. Six buttons over here. Again, gonna bring the ribbon cable down and over. Want everything to be nice and straight so when you put it together, it all fits. Wires can eat up your empty space pretty quickly. All right, so I've attached this cable over here and I'm going to kind of have a hinge here where it folds over itself and then it will attach to this board here. And then this end we will attach to our teensy board, which I'll, prob I'll probably do that first actually. Well, yeah, I'll do that first. Well, actually I won't. <laughs> I started on this side wiring it so I could go down the line to make the cable as flat as possible. Over here I have a little bit more room so it's not as important. That's why I did it that way. There's a method to my madness. Okay, all the wiring is done so I'm going to go over all the parts one more time. Here are the right hand side buttons and the ribbon cable leading to the Teensy. The Teensy of course. The analog joystick hooked up to the Teensy. The two left buttons hooked up to the Teensy. The Teensy is a hid controller plugged into the USB. Batteries here, batteries go through the charger plug, up to the power switch, and then back down to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has a five volt regulator here. Our LCD is here. So let's fold it up and play with it. I retained the HDMI port so I can still hook this up to a full-size monitor and get full-size resolutions. While I'm here, I'll show you how to get uh, MAME on your Raspberry Pi. 
The new uh, distributions of Debian Wheezy have a Pi Store on it, so you just double click on Pi Store, then you search for MAME, and it will install it automatically to your Raspberry Pi. I'm gonna play this old game Trojan. I had this cartridge on my Nintendo, but there's an arcade version too. Oh, I can jump. Yay. Ah! Let's get this guy. Die! So I went headphone only for a couple reasons. A, I didn't have any speakers laying around. B, there was no room for them if I did. Oh, well. Let's try a different game here. What else we got? <laughs> oh, Xenophobe, that was a cool game. Time Pilot. Oh, of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a classic. So here are our buttons. So uh, we can go to the menu, change our input and whatnot. Uh, we can insert a coin, and then we can push start. So there you go. We took the Raspberry Pi and made it into a small, compact, battery-powered form. I hope this inspires you to make your own cool projects with the Raspberry Pi. Today's viewer question comes from Jim who asks, I was wondering if you're going to sell your pin hack pinball system to other hobbyists to make their own games. The answer is yes, we are planning to, though right now the priority is finishing our Ghost Squad pinball machine. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and also YouTube to see the progress on the new system. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll discuss the basics of schematics, which are drawings that represent electronic circuits. We'll see you then. Stay tuned at element14.com forward slash TBHS where you can join the discussion, suggest builds for the show, and even have a chance to win upcoming builds. Remember, you can always email build ideas to benheck at element14.com. Thanks for watching.